Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of today's lecture is principles of phototherapy. Phototherapy is one of the very important therapies that are that is used in clinical dermatology. And the details about uh, this therapy is very important as far as the examination and day-to-day -day working of a dermatologist is concerned. So that is why I think this lecture is very important. And I would like to split this lecture into two uh, parts so that you may be able to grasp as much as possible. I am Professor Dr. Asher Ahmed Mashu, and you can follow me on Instagram, email, and WhatsApp. Before I start my lecture, let's discuss what the ultraviolet radiations are. The ultraviolet radiation is that part of the solar electromagnetic spectrum that lies between the X-rays and visible light. So ultraviolet radiations are basically non-ionizing radiations. There are three kinds of ultraviolet radiations, the ultraviolet A, ultraviolet B, and ultraviolet C. Ultraviolet A comprises of wavelengths between 320 to 400 nanometer. Beyond 400 nanometer, the visible light starts. Ultraviolet B is between 280 and 320 nanometer. And the ultraviolet C is less than 280 nanometer. The International Commission on Illumination now makes the cutoff between ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B as 315 nanometer rather than 320 nanometer. But in this chapter, in most of the occasions, 320 nanometer is used. The, on Earth, you can we can witness ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B rays, but ultraviolet C is filtered by the ozone layer in the Earth atmosphere. As far as the two radiations are concerned, ultraviolet B radiation are significantly more effective, 100 to 1000 times more potent than ultraviolet A in producing erythema, the cellular effects and DNA damage. Ultraviolet A radiations, although are less energetic than ultraviolet B radiation, but they tend to penetrate more deeply into the skin because they have a longer wavelength particularly the ultraviolet A1 therapy, which is mainly implicated in the chronic photo damage. So introduction to phototherapy. The phototherapy or light therapy, also known as the heliotherapy, is a form of treatment involving the administration of non-ionizing ultraviolet radiations in a controlled manner to the skin. So the phototherapy comprises of administration of ultraviolet radiation in a controlled manner to the skin. The UVA spectrum. This is commonly defined to lie between 320 nanometer to 400 nanometer. And usually, uh, this ultraviolet A radiations are used in combination with uh, sorolens. And that the combination of sorolens with UVA makes it PUVA therapy. The skin diseases responsive to PUVA are similar to those which are responsive to ultraviolet B therapy, and in particular, psoriasis and eczema. The mechanism of action of PUVA includes cross-linking of DNA by sorolin, inhibition of DNA 
replication, Langerhans cell depletion, the immunosuppressive effect created by T lymphocyte, uh, by its effect on T lymphocyte function and its migration. And the PUVA also restores TH17 regulatory T cell imbalance. So this function is particularly important in management of psoriasis. Among the UVA spectrum, if we narrow it down to three U, uh, if we narrow it down to 340 to 400 nanometer, these are the longer wavelengths of UVA and are labeled as UVA1 therapy. This is shown to be beneficial in number of chronic dermatoses that include atopic dermatitis and sclerosing skin disorders. UVA1 phototherapy is distinct from PUVA therapy as this therapy does not involve the sorolin ingestion. UVA1 phototherapy penetrates deeper into the dermis and induces interstitial collagenase production and several cytokines, resulting in softening of sclerotic skin. In addition, UVA1 phototherapy causes reduction in tumor necrosis factor alpha in the skin, amongst other mediator effect. And it is also cytotoxic with T-cell apoptosis being a prominent feature of UVA1 therapy. Now, some uh, thing about UVB therapy. This uh, wavelength of UVB is between 280 to 320 nanometer. There are two kinds of UVB lamps. The one which emits a broad band of UVB and this broad band UVB emits a wavelength between 270 to 350 nanometer. Uh, and it is quite obvious that this wavelength also include a part of UVA as well. Then there is a second kind of lamp which is most popular nowadays is a narrow band UVB which is produced by special lamp which is called as TL01R and this emits a shorter wavelength between 311 and 313 nanometer. In recent years narrow band UVB has largely replaced the use of broadband UVB. The UVB phototherapy has anti-inflammatory, immunosuppressive, and cytotoxic properties. The mechanism of action are unclear, but it include induction of cis uh, urocanic acid, Langerhans cell depletion, altered antigen presentation, decrease activity of natural killer cells and apoptosis of T lymphocytes and keratinocytes. So all these effects results in its anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive properties. Then the fourth type of phototherapy that is employed is ECP or extracorporeal photophoresis. This therapy involves addition of sorolin to patients' white cells after they have been separated from the whole blood, uh, whole blood in vitro. This photoactivated white cells are then irradiated with ultraviolet A and reinfused back to the patients. This photophoresis is used to treat the erythrodermic stage of cutaneous T cell lymphoma chronic graft versus host disease, and some other conditions. Photophoresis hits the dendritic cells acquiring antigen from the apoptotic lymphocytes and elicit a specific immune response without causing systemic immunosuppression. Whatever phototherapy we use in our clinics, it is by these artificial light sources. 
So we need to know what are these artificial light sources and how does these light sources produce ultraviolet light. The most common mean of producing ultraviolet radiations artificially is by passage of electric current through mercury vapors which are enclosed in a fluorescent tube. So the hardware includes fluorescent tubes that are filled with mercury vapors which are charged by the electric current. The excited electrons of the mercury are absorbed by the phosphor coating on inside of the tube which results in emission of radiations of longer wavelengths by the process of fluorescence. So these fluorescent light tube lights, they are coated with phosphor and this uh, excited electrons, which are excited by excited electrons of mercury, which are excited by the electric current, they are absorbed by the phosphor coating and emits a uh, radiation, which is the reason, which is the mechanism of production of ultraviolet light. By changing this phosphor uh, the variety of different spectra of UVA and UVB light are emitted. UVA1 is produced either by low output fluorescence tube such as TL10 by Philips or high output metal halides UVA1 source which requires cooling as well. So this is the mechanism of production of ultraviolet radiation, artificial. The equipment for delivery of phototherapy. Wide variety of narrow band UVB units are available that includes the whole body cabins, the whole body panels, small panels, irradiators and point sources. The whole body cabins contain 1800 millimeter long fluorescent tubes that line the walls in front of the reflective metal surfaces, which enable greater dose uniformity and greater treatment efficacy. So the fluorescence tube are placed on reflecting metal surfaces to produce the even, uh, even sort of um, light. Whole body panels necess necessitates rotation of patients to provide the uniform irradiation from the back and the front position and require uh, posture and uh, to avoid the under or overdosing. Furthermore, these units are a significant UV hazard to others who must avoid passing in front of these panels. However, these panels may be used for home phototherapy. Small panel irradiators are used for palmer and planter skin. Point source devices, which are uh, marketed as excimer lasers, avoid unnecessary irradiation to unaffected skin but care is needed to avoid under or overdosing at overlap areas. PUVA units are either whole body cables or small panel irradiators or small panels for hand and feet or other localized areas like leg and scalp. For um, phototherapy units, uh, calibration and dosimetry is must because this will provide consistency and repeatability of the treatment dose. It is essential that irradiance of a UV unit being used is determined at regular interval and the dose calculated is based on the following formula. The dose emitted from an ultraviolet unit is in millijoules per centimeter square, which is a multiplication of irradiance, which is measured in milliwatts per centimeter square 
into time in seconds. It is important that the performed that this calibration is performed by a special instrument which is called as the radiometers, which are traceable back to the national reference. This ensures that the treatment delivered at one phototherapy center is the same at any other, other phototherapy center in the world. So if you buy a phototherapy unit from a reputable firm, and then it is the duty of that reputable firm to calibrate your phototherapy unit periodically. And they usually give it in your contract that they will be doing this. If this is not written in the contract, then do ask them to write it in the contract. Another terminology which you need to remember is the designated patient irradiance, DPI. To determine the mean UV irradiance to which a patient will be exposed in a whole body cabin, DPI is calculated. And this is for a subject, the average height and built at chest, the waist, and the knee level. Irradiance is measured at 12 different sites, anterior, posterior, and lateral, and is determined by two ways, the direct measurement and indirect measurement. In a direct measurement, uh, operator measures this irradiance from the specific site when the patient is standing in a cabin and the and the investigator is wearing the protective clothing and goggles. While in indirect method, the radiometer is clamped to a stand whose position can be changed and altered while the patient is standing within this cabin. Now the indications of phototherapy, both narrowband, UVB or PUVA therapy. So mainly the indications are similar in both the two kind of therapies. That is psoriasis mainly, atopic eczema number two, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma number three, vitiligo at number four, and desensitization of polymorphic light eruption at number five, and other rare conditions like lichen planus, nodular prurigo, palmoplantar pustulosis, petriasis lachinoides chronicus, petriasis rubra pilaris, chronic anticaria, and intractable pruritus. Psoriasis. Narrowband UVB can be used to treat all variants except the generalized pustular psoriasis and the erythrodermic psoriasis for which PUVA is the treatment of choice. Narrowband UVB is more effective than broadband UVB and is on average similar efficacy to PUVA in treatment of psoriasis. So this is a very important, uh, important line that as far as the efficacy of uh, treatment, narrowband UVB is similar to PUVA in all indications except the generalized pustular psoriasis and erythrodermic psoriasis. Thin plaques, as seen in guttate and seborrheic psoriasis, are affected best by narrowband UVB therapy. And this therapy is preferred to UVA because there is a less skin cancer risk. It is easier to administer as we don't require ingestions of sorolin has a shorter exposure time that facilitates the patient compliance. PUVA should be considered in those patients who have failed to respond to UVB and whose duration of remission after UVB is short. Then the second indication is atopic eczema. It is treated effectively with broadband UVB Combined UVB and UVA, UVA1, narrowband UVB and PUVA. So all therapies have been tried. It is commonly stated that it is preferable that UVA1 therapy, if available, should be used for acute fears, 
and narrow band UVB therapy is used for chronic disease. A flare of disease is often seen in early stage of the treatment, usually due to the heat which is generated in the cabinets. So lower dose increments and more long treatment is resorted to as compared to psoriasis. The clinical impression is that relapse also tend to be more frequent than in psoriasis, although there is no firm objective evidence of this statement. UVA can be considered if UVB has failed or in severe atopic eczema in children which, are, which is associated with growth retardation. Then the third very important indication of phototherapy is cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Narrowband UVB and PUVA have both been effectively used for the treatment of CTCL. UVB is particularly effective in patch stage, while PUVA is more effective in plaque stage. Increased inflammation may be seen in early stages of treatment, which settles without stopping the therapy. So the therapy should not be stopped if the patient complains of increased erythema or increased inflammation. The sensory sites, such as the flexures, which are less accessible to phototherapy, should be particularly taken care of. Then the indication in which the phototherapy is not very effective is vitiligo. It responds both to narrowband UVB and PUVA, but narrowband UVB is more effective than PUVA, but the response is variable and treatment has to be prolonged for many months or years. The affected area that tend to be more photoresponsive include those on the face, and if it is of recent onset and of limited extent. And particularly if that area contains some pigmented hair and involving the non-acral sites. So if the patient presents in the early stage of the disease with lesions on the face and non-acral site, and particularly the lesions have pigmented hair, then it will be more effective, affected by the phototherapy. The acral sites are typically less responsive. One of the side effects or problem with the, this therapy in vitiligo is tanning of the normal skin, which exaggerates the contrast between the vitiligenous skin and the normal skin, especially patients with dark skin type. Patients of skin type 1 and 2 are more risk of burning. Patients should be carefully selected for the therapy and risk benefit should be clearly explained to them while putting them on phototherapy. Phototherapy can also be used to um, for desensitization in patients with polymorphic light eruption. Both narrowband and UV uh, PUVA is used, but the former is used more frequently nowadays at, as narrowband UVB has better safety profile. This is usually administered in the springtime before the sunny, uh, before the summers. Provocation of rash, which occurs approximately in 50% of the patients, is managed with topical corticosteroid cream and reduction of the dose. The patients are typically given 15 treatments three times a week for five weeks every spring for consecutive three years prior to the year without the treatment to assess whether there is any change in disease expression or not. Then a very important question, there are choice between narrowband UVB and PUVA. Narrowband UVB is now much more commonly used than PUVA. This is primarily due to the well-documented cumulative risk of skin cancer that is associated with PUVA. In addition, many studies have shown the efficacy of narrowband UVB for psoriasis and other dermatoses is comparable to PUVA. 
it should not be forgotten that puva penetrates more deeply into the skin and uvb radiation Uh, UVB radiation are thus best uh, suited. And uh, therefore, poor radiation are best suited for thick plaques and specially treating palm and sores. The relapse rate of psoriasis by UVB therapy is short, while with poor it is long. Poor is also effective in generalized pustular psoriasis and in asodermic psoriasis as compared to narrowband UVB. So, what are the factors that favor the use of narrowband UVB therapy? The first and foremost is the convenience. There is no need of oral medications or the protective eyewear before and after the therapy. If the plaques are thin and there is a macular disease, UVB is preferred. It is preferred in pregnancy because it is pregnancy safe. Skin type 1 and 2 uh, are at high risk of puva induced skin cancers. If the patient is having photosensitivity to UVA but not to UVB, patients suffering from liver or gastrointestinal diseases, which is a contraindication of uh, puva therapy. Then if patient is... Uh, has a poor compliance and uncooperative, then UVB is preferred. And patients who are less than 18 years of age. When PUVA is preferred over narrowband UVB, failure to respond to UVB or rapid relapse following UVB therapy. Then patient having thick plaques, palmoplantar disease, nail disease, Photosensitivity to UVB but not to UVA. Erythrodermic or generalized pustular psoriasis. Petriasis rubra pilaris, which is usually flared up by UVB and treated by puva therapy. So it's important now to discuss what are the absolute and relative contraindication to phototherapy. So the absolute contraindication include dysplastic nevus syndrome, systemic lupus erythematosus, dermatomyositis, genetic skin cancer syndromes like xeroderma pigmentosa and Gorlin syndrome, congenital photosensitivity syndromes like Bloom syndrome and cocaine syndrome, patient unwilling or unable to comply with the safety procedures, patient who are medically unfit and are unable to stand, for a prolonged period of time, especially those suffering from severe cardiovascular or respiratory diseases. The relative contraindications include age less than 16 years. So these indications means that they are not very important but should be followed. Patients suffering from previous or current non-melanoma skin cancer. There is a history of previous melanoma previous exposure to arsenic or some ionizing radiations like x-rays, current pre-malignant skin lesions, con con concomitant immunosuppressive therapy like cyclosporin, photo-induced epilepsy, pregnancy, UVB is safe in pregnancy, PUVA is not. Bullous pemphigoid or pemphigus, patient having cat tract and significant liver dysfunction, particularly with PUVA. Since UVA1 therapy is little different from both PUVA and uh, narrowband UVB, we will discuss it separately. The evidence base for UVA1 relates mainly to its use in atopic eczema and sclerosing skin conditions, particularly morphia and scleroderma and some subtypes of lupus erythematosus. It is also tried in certain other indications like urticaria pigmentosa, in disseminated granuloma annular, in CDCL and psoriasis, in HIV patients. It is never a first-line phototherapy and its availability is present at specialized centers only. 
in a topic eczema if available uva1 phototherapy is of benefit particularly in atopic prurigo and is considered in should be considered in patient who have failed to respond to narrowband uvb and puva uva1 is found to be superior to potent topical corticosteroid and broadband uva and uvb therapy in certain studies in sclerosing skin conditions there is evidence that uva1 therapy is effective especially in cutaneous sclerosis and morphia and in systemic sclerosis particularly if the disease is progressive symptomatic and restricting the movements there is a limited evidence to support its use in treatment <laughs> of cutaneous and chronic graft versus host disease in nephrogenic fibrosing dermatopathy and in both extra genital and genital lichen sclerosis uva1 at a medium dose is shown to be superior to narrowband uvb or even low dose treatment can be effective although prolonged treatment course may be needed then lupus erythematosus paradoxically there is a good evidence for use of very low dose that is 6 joules per centimeter square per individual dose UVA1 is successfully used for subacute cutaneous LE in tumid LE but it is less responsive in CDL now the indications of extra corporeal foot corporeal photochemotherapy ECP or photophoresis has evidence of benefit for the treatment of erythrodermic cutaneous t cell lymphoma and for graft versus host disease and is also used for a wide range of skin diseases like systemic sclerosis some immunobullous disorders psoriasis atopic eczema lichen planus lupus erythematosus scleroderm scleroderma and dermatomyositis however the evidence of benefit in these treatment uh, diseases is generally weak it's of interest that the best evidence for efficacy of ecp is in prophylaxis of cardiac transplant rejection cutaneous t cell lymphoma ecp is licensed for treatment of ctcl particularly in patient with erythrodermic disease including those with cesarean syndrome the patient respond best are those having a disease of shorter duration with normal cd8 positive cell count and are immunocompetent with circulating cesarean cells the added benefit is claimed if it is combined with interferon bexerotene and electron beam therapy then graft versus host disease there is evidence that ecp is of benefit for chronic graft versus host disease particularly for cutaneous and mucosal involvement there is little evidence of benefit for associated hepatic disease then uvb phototherapy administration phototherapy is frequently referred now as uvb therapy and is either by two different type of lamps the broadband and narrowband now it's shown that the narrowband uvb is much more effective than broadband and hence it has largely replaced the broadband uvb therapy so now whenever you will hear about a uvb therapy lamp it will be a narrowband uvb it's recommended that the starting dose of uvb therapy is based on the minimal erythema dose in order to reduce the risk of burning on one hand and under treatment on the other hand and to detect unsuspected photosensitivity in a patient the minimum erythema dose it's very important 
This is defined in UK as dose of UVB radiation that produce minimal or just perceptible erythema at 24 hours post irradiation. So the minimum erythema that is produced by a wavelength 24 hours after irradiation is the minimal erythema dose. Undertaking MED or a small area test dose is important to detect unsuspected abnormal photosensitivity. This can happen rarely. There is a poor correlation between minimal erythema dose and skin type, so it is not affected by the skin type. MED is determined by use of the homemade template or by using automatic or semi-automatic UV exposure devices. We will, we will discuss these devices shortly. The homemade template consists of a UV opaque material in which there are number of aperture or holes, usually of size by 2 by 2 centimeter. Through each aperture, a different dose of UVB is delivered to the skin. Rest of the body is adequately protected from irradiation by using protective gown and goggles. The range of dose is usually selected based on the skin phototype and geometric series and is usually between uh, usually uh, labeled as 25 millijoules, 50, 70, 100, 140, 200, 280, 390, 550, 650, and 770 for narrowband UVB. And usual site is back avoiding the midline. Assessment of erythema. So after irradiation, uh, the skin is examined after 24 hours. It can be visually analyzed uh, to determine the minimal erythema dose or a reflectance instrument known as the erythema meter can be used to objectively assess the er intensity of erythema. Since this instrument is not readily available, we mainly rely on the visual assessment of minima, minimal erythema dose. So, for example, in this case, in which 10 different doses is delivered to the skin, the minimal erythema dose is at 200 millijoules per second square, centimeter square. This is a semi-automated handheld UV device known as Dermalite ATMED. This is placed directly on the skin being tested. The plate in contact with the skin is perforated with number of apertures. You can see the apertures fitted with UV attenuated mesh foil. One such device delivers 10 doses with an attenuation factor of 1.26 between the apertures, allowing a sequence of dose to be delivered. The regimen variables, starting dose. Once the minimal erythema dose is calculated for a patient, to achieve clearance, it is not necessary to use the erythemogenic dose. So the starting dose is generally kept as 50% or 70% of the minimal erythema dose to minimize the development of significant erythema. For example, in this patient where the minimal erythema dose is 200, the starting dose will be somewhere around 100, which is 50% of the erythema dose. Then increments. As the skin acclimatizes to the UVB therapy, with epidermal thickening and increased pigmentation, you have to increase the dose. Comparison of low increment regime that is 20% with high increment regime that is 40% showed that the 20% result in 50% less episode of significant erythema that required postponement 
of the treatment. So it's better to increment the dose, um, uh, low increment dose. After that, low dose regimen is advocated with reduction. If the postponement of uh, treatment is done by erythema, then after the erythema, once we restart the narrowband UVB therapy, then the increment should be less than 10%. 20% increment of dose is, uh, uh, for example, if we are giving the 100 millijoules per centimeter square, then 20% increment means after every exposure, we increase it by 20 joule, millijoules per centimeter square. That is 100, 120, 140, 1, uh, 140, 160, 180, like this. Frequency. The treatment with narrowband UVB is done three times a week. It is preferred to five times a week, especially for a skin phenotype 1 to 3, for the sake of convenience. Both twice and thrice a week regimen are effective for psoriasis, although three times a week treatment is more effective than two times a week treatment. Number of exposure. Clearance of psoriasis is usually achieved within 20 to 25 treatments, although more prolonged course may be needed, particularly in stubborn disease. The atopic eczema requires more dosage, more prolonged treatment, then used for the psoriasis. We have discussed that for PMLA, polymorphic light eruption, each year 15 doses, three times a week for five consecutive weeks is used. Ways to deliver the phototherapy. This is the narrowband UVB cabinet, which is comprising of TL01 fluorescent tube lights. These are also the full body, um, full body panels. The, and uh, in both these two panels, the patient has to stand first from the front and then from the back. Irradiation. This is a special hand and foot unit used for hand and foot disease. Treatment with two to six multiples of minimal erythema dose can clear psoriasis plaques in 5 to 6 treatment. So if the minimal erythema dose is 100, uh, multiply by 2, it means uh, 200, multiply by 6, it means 600. So if we reach to this kind of um, irradiation, then uh, the psoriasis is likely to be treated in 5 to 6 treatments. Home-based phototherapy units are particularly advocated. This is a home-based May a home based PUVA therapy unit, uh, UVB therapy unit. It is helpful because it helps the old patients in getting the treatment who cannot attend the hospital because of the geographical, work, economic, and other reasons. But it has raised concern of suboptimal therapy. However, on cost analysis basis, the home phototherapy units are cost effective and the development of this mean of treatment delivery should be encouraged for especially old patients. Now the PUVA administration. The PUVA and Sorolin. The most frequently used Sorolin for oral use is 8-methoxysorolin or 5-methoxysorolin. The former is used preferentially as it is considered to be more effective and less expensive. Nausea is one of the common side effects with 8-methoxysorolin, and if occurred, then we have to resort to 5-methoxysorolin. The dose of sorolin used is 0.6 mg per kg for 8-methoxysorolin and 1.2 mg per kg for 5-methoxysorolin. Oral 8-methoxysorolin is taken 2 hours before uh, the treatment, with light meal and 5 methoxysorolin about 2.5 to 3 hours before the treatment. Then topical sorolins. They are used for centuries for treatment of vitiligo. 
Sorolin currently used for topical therapy include 8 methoxysorolin and tri methyl sorolin. In equivalent concentration, TMP is up to 30 times more phototoxic and is now rarely used. Sorolin can be applied topically in variety of ways. A bath solution for whole body treatment, soak, paint, cream, gel for hands, feet, scalp and other localized areas. The topical PUVA therapy is preferred over oral therapy in patients with hepatic dysfunctions, in gastrointestinal disease, patient with cataract, poor compliance with eye protection, risk of drug interaction, especially if patient is taking warfarin, and it allows shorter irradiation time, especially for children and elderly, and those who are claustrophobic and cannot stand in closed chambers. The frequently used bath puva regimen in UK involves dissolving 30 ml of 1.2% 8 methoxysorolin in 140 liter of water with a final concentration of 2.6 mg per liter. Patient bathes in this water for 15 minutes followed by immediate exposure to UVA. When treating hand and feet with topical puva, there should be a 30 minutes delay prior to irradiation to allow sorolin absorb in the palmer skin, planter skin. Just like we calculate the minimal erythema dose in UVB, we calculate the minimal phototoxic dose in puva. It is determined in similar way to MED except that it is measured two hours after the ingestion of uh, 8 methoxysorolin. Then the typical UVA test dose are 0.5. They are in joules, not millijoules. So the dose is 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 1, 1.4, 2, 2.8, 3.7, 5.5, and 7.7. .7, and lastly, 10.8 10 joules per centimeter squared. And the test site is read after 72 to 96 hours, not after 24 hours. Because the erythema is a delayed erythema. The minimal phototoxic dose testing allows determination of the optimal starting dose and allow identification of underdosing or poor absorption and also identify the patients who are unusually photosensitive. Then the starting dose, the regimen variables. The starting dose like uh, in UVB should be 40% um, of the minimal toxic dose for topical PUVA and 70% for oral PUVA. The minimal phototoxic, the minimal phototoxic dose testing, if unavailable and too expensive, and the patient disease is too extensive, then um, the starting dose is based on the following formula. If the patient is of skin type 1, then the starting dose will be 0.5 joules per centimeter square. If skin type 2, then 1. Skin type 3, 1.5. And in skin type 4, it will be 2 joules per centimeter square. The starting dose of bath puva should always be based on minimal phototoxic dose testing because of risk of severe photosensitivity. Show this so this kind of therapy should not be done if minimal phototoxic dose testing is not done. Increments. Doses are normally increased by 20 to 40% increments. Lower increments may be indicated if significant erythema develops. Then the frequency. Puva therapy is usually administered twice a week. As puva erythema is sets in late, more recent studies have shown that the peak topical puva erythema occur between 96 hours and 144 hours. Number of exposure. The number of exposures required are similar to that of TL01 UVB therapy as there is significantly more risk of skin cancer associated with puva. 
so the number of treatments should be kept at minimum and maintenance therapy is avoided. Ways to deliver PUVA. So just like UVB chamber, there are UVA cham UVB chamber, there are UVA chamber or PUVA chambers. PUVA can also be delivered locally with units that is used to irradiate hands and feet like I have shown before. Bath PUVA and localized PUVA are also available for patients when systemic PUVA is not recommended or less appropriate. Then eye protection. Following ingestion of sorolin, the patient need to require uh, to wear a UVA absorbing glasses before the therapy and 24 hours after the therapy. During therapy, UV blocking goggles must be worn. Eye protection with Bauhat Puva is only necessary if patient has an extensive disease when there is a risk of systemic absorption of sorolin. Then combination therapy. For all kinds of skin diseases that require phototherapy, combination therapy with topical or systemic agents is always preferred because it increases the clinical response to psoriasis and decreases the number of phototherapy exposures and thus the cumulative dose. The topical agents which are combined with phototherapy include emollient star dethranol, Tezerotene and vitamin D analogs like calcipitrol. However, the immunomodulator agents like tacrolimus and pimercolimus are not used with phototherapy. Then the systemic agents, there is a good evidence that the drug which is to be combined with phototherapy is retinoids. And this is called as repuva or reUVB. This increases the efficacy of phototherapy significantly with dose sparing effects. Retinoids are also beneficial because of its protective effect against skin cancers. Other systemic immunosuppressive therapy like cyclosporin is absolutely contraindicated to avoid the augmentation of skin cancers. Narrowband UVB enhances the efficacy of biological agents and must be combined if biological agents like alphacept, eternacept, adilumumab, and ustikunumab is used. UVA-1 phototherapy administration. Since the UVA-1 therapy is different from PUVA therapy, as I've already mentioned that it does not require ingestion of sorolin, the wavelength use is long, that is 240 to 340 to 400 nanometer. UVA-1 phototherapy is used in four different categories. The high dose is between more than 60 joules per centimeter square. The medium dose is 30 to 60 joules per centimeter square. Low dose is 10 to 20 joules per centimeter square and very low is less than 10 joules per centimeter square. The starting dose is again based on the minimal erythema dose and is usually 50% of the MED. Increment is 10 to 50% depending upon whether or not erythema develops. Treatment is delivered 3 to 4 times a week. The number of exposures is minimum of 15 treatments before deciding whether to continue or not. UVA-1 is delivered by special lamps and devices uh, which are low irradiance lamps such as Philips TL10 or metal halide, metal halide portable. Then the last is the extracorporeal phototherapy administration. This photophoresis involves three steps. The first is the leukophoresis that is removal of white blood cells photoactivation of these white cells and reinfusion. The whole blood is removed from the patient and then centrifuge to separate red blood cells from RBCs. This buffy coat which is produced contains WBCs and some plasma in RBC. It is then mixed with saline and 8 methoxysorlin, the buffy coat, and is photoactivated by passing through a plastic film which is irradiated by UVA lamp. This irradiated buffy coat is then reinfused back into the patient. Phototesting 
the minimal phototoxic dose is not necessary in uh, photophoresis because the irradiation takes place outside the patient's body. Regimen variables. Standard dose of UVA delivered to the patient lymphocyte is 1 to 2 joules per centimeter squared. This extracorporeal photophoresis is done 2 to 3 times, 2 to 3 on done on 3 consecutive days, 2 to 3 consecutive days once a month. For graft versus host disease, it is repeated after every 2 to 3 weeks. The frequency of treatment can be increased in non-responders. Number of treatment is generally confined, continued, uh, the treatment is generally continued for six months before declaring the patient as a treatment failure. This is the machine to deliver extracorporeal photophoresis. So this brings to end of this talk. And uh, next time I'll join you, inshallah, with my part two of uh, this phototherapy. In part two, I will be discussing the side effects and how to avoid the side effects and some other important um, uh, important things regarding the phototherapy. And I will be briefly discussing the laser. So thank you all and have a very good day.